These jagged rocks define the perimeter of an ancient land. It lies on the northernmost tip of Madagascar, an island 400 kilometers off the coast of Africa. The landscape was formed millions of years ago when a coral reef rose out of the sea and turned to stone. Beyond the walls of rock lies a lost world we're only just beginning to understand. Because Ankarana is so remote, it's a journey few care to make. But its isolation is precisely the attraction for French scientist Olivier Berra. When you're a scientist, you come into a country like Madagascar, which is huge, no work at all has been done. So you have to rely on the local people. That's why Angeline Razafia Mansoa is with him. He's a self-taught expert on the region's unique animals. Together they are heading north, way off the beaten track, to visit the lost world. From afar, Ankarana dominates the skyline. Within its rocky walls are forests where plant and animal life has evolved independently, cut off from the outside world. What was once coral is now a wall of solid rock, towering 300 meters above the surrounding plains. It held the outside world at bay until the 1930s, and since then, only a handful of scientists have come this far. Olivier and Angeline know you don't have to climb up and over the sheer rock walls to get inside. Beneath the rocks are caves and tunnels that open into the world beyond. These caves hold a particular fascination for Olivier Berra because they contain clues to the lives of the local people and their relationship with the animals of Ankarana. This is believed to be one of the most extensive cave systems in the world. The interior is a place for the living and the dead. Still largely unexplored, its murky waters hold many secrets. But what's certain is that high above the caves, there's life on these craggy peaks. Carved by centuries of rain, these razor-sharp spikes called singi are home to a creature that walks on a knife edge. These high climbers are crowned lemurs. They may look delicate, but they are specialists at survival in one of the harshest places on Earth. Their sensitive fingers and toes have evolved protective padding so they can tiptoe on the needles. Crowned lemurs live nowhere else in the world but here and a few neighboring patches of forest. These are castaways on an island of stone, 
And though they can scale its high peaks, the heart of their territory lies below. Lemurs live in family groups with one undisputed leader, who's always a female. This troop is protected by the singular gaze of their one-eyed queen. Despite her impairment, she's a successful leader and a mother. This is her eldest daughter, also carrying a newborn. From the moment of birth, a baby must get a good grip of its mother and hang on for dear life. The males in the troop are easy to tell apart from the females because of the distinctive black V on their heads. There is a strict pecking order in this matriarchal society. Mothers with young babies get particularly short-tempered with the males. But the males do have a role to play in Lima society. They share guardianship of the territory and use their scent glands to mark out its boundaries. The crowned lemurs patrol their patch to keep out any competition. In this dry forest, there is limited food and water. The trees here have adapted to drought conditions, but for part of the year, small rivers run through the forest and drain into the caves that underpin the massif. The eroded rocks above also channel rainwater through the massif into one of two rivers that flow across the surrounding land. Crocodiles can be found on these rivers, and Olivier has a lifelong fascination with these ancient creatures. My discovery of the crocodile was uh, about 15 years ago, and when I caught the first baby crocodile, to tell that a miniature dinosaur in my hands was just so fascinating. And since then, every year I learn more about crocodiles. These are Nile crocodiles, a species that originated in Africa. Scientists are still debating how they managed to cross the 400 kilometer stretch of sea that separates Madagascar from the mainland. There are few places in the world where it is possible to see a group of large adults like these. Look, this is a big one. He's absolutely huge. It's really so rare to see them so easily here. Large, mature crocodiles are so dangerous to people that they have been wiped out across most of Africa. But here, they have a special relationship with the local tribe. The Antikarana people believe that crocodiles are sacred. By sacrificing a precious Malagasy cow known as a zebu, they demonstrate the importance they attach to crocodiles. They worship them because they believe in an ancient myth. Once, a sorcerer was refused a drink of water by the Antikarana people, and in anger, he turned them into crocodiles. The villagers now believe these crocodiles are their reincarnated ancestors. Persecuted everywhere else in Madagascar, crocodiles are cherished by the people here. Like everything else in Angarana, 
Its people and their traditions are unique. Living here for hundreds of years, they have developed their own dialect and a spiritual bond with the land and its animals. The crowned lemur is the other creature they accept as family. Perhaps because to look at a lemur is to catch a glimpse of our most ancient ancestors. <laughs> One of the tribal elders, Bizondri, explains how much people have in common with lemurs. They suckle their babies like humans. They carry babies on their backs like humans do and hold a baby like humans. When they sit, the babies are in their lap. They have five fingers because they were human. And they have nails because they were humans that turned into lemurs. That's why we don't eat them, not children or adults. No one does. Because lemurs look like people, the anti coroner believe they have human souls. Lemurs are primates like monkeys, apes and humans, but they are distant relatives. About 50 million years ago, they were marooned on Madagascar and started to evolve independently. Lemurs and their forests have been destroyed across much of the island. The last stronghold for crowned lemurs is Ankarana. The beliefs of its people, like the walls of the Massif, are a barrier against the dangers of the outside world. For young lemurs, this forest is a sanctuary to grow up in. Now she is about six weeks old, this little female is allowed to explore the trees for the first time. But she is only allowed off her mother's back if they're in a thicket that provides a safe climbing frame. The queen is even more cautious. She hasn't let her little male off her back yet, and she has a good reason. Her forest may be protected on all sides, but danger lurks within. These tree-gripping claws belong to Madagascar's rarest native carnivore, the foos. The lemurs may be agile climbers, but so is the foos, making it a formidable predator. This is something the queen knows only too well. She may have come face to face with a foos before. Her blind eye may be the result of a previous encounter. The strategy is to head for narrow branches too weak to support the foos. From there, she has an escape route for her troop. One by one, her family jump a gap too wide for the foos to risk. The foos is a specialist hunter. Lemurs make up half its diet. But under the queen's expert leadership, her troop has developed an early warning system that has allowed them to stay one step ahead of their determined predator. But Ankarana's largest carnivore doesn't live in the trees. It lurks in the water.
The French scientist Olivier Berra is on the trail of more information about the crocodiles he sighted on Anne Carina's rivers. And he knows who to ask. The knowledge of the local people is very important looking to crocodiles because they've been living with them for generations, so they know their habits. The fishermen know where they stay, they know where they breed, they know also where they see young animals. This fisherman is called Kafu. He lives on the windswept plains near the river where Olivier spotted the big crocodiles. So I know that he's a fisherman. This is what we saw with all these nets around. Does he catch crocodiles sometimes in his net? If they get caught in my nets, I wouldn't kill them because they are sacred animals. Kavu says at this time of year there are five or six of them on the river. The exciting thing is that he tells Olivier where to find nesting females. This is one area. One special area. We'll go further, you know, to look at the river a little bit. So, thank you, Kafu. It's a breakthrough. Without inside information, it could have taken Olivier weeks to track them down. The female lays a clutch of up to 100 eggs in total. She covers her eggs to protect them from the extreme heat. Temperature is particularly critical to baby crocodiles when they are developing in the egg. Crocodiles are adapted to Ankarana's arid conditions. So too are the forests. The trees don't fruit at the same time each year, and sometimes without warning, they simply stop fruiting. The most impressive tree in the forest is a giant fig. It is a landmark for the lemurs because it is a reliable source of food. The queen understands the timetable of the forest and is quick to lead her troop to the fig tree when the fruit is ripe. But for some, it's the first time at such dizzy heights. The figs will only last for a couple of weeks, and there's tough competition for them. Crowns are not the only lemurs in the trees. Sanford's lemurs have an uneasy relationship with the crowns. Crowns dominate the forest, and their shy neighbors do their best to avoid them. Whilst the figs are plentiful, the two species cooperate, sharing the same tree to feed and sleep. Lemurs are creatures of habit, and at dusk the activities of the day cease. At least, that's what's been previously believed. But our knowledge of what animals do at night has been limited by the obvious problems of seeing them in the dark. sensitive cameras that can film by moon and starlight alone, it is possible to reveal the dark side of Ankarana. The camera is so sensitive that a firefly burns like a firework. Even inside the caves, the camera can pick out bats as they leave their daytime roosting sites. 
There are thought to be more bat species in Ankarana than anywhere else in Madagascar, but most haven't even been identified yet. And it's not just bats that come out at night. Some lemurs are active too. The lepi lemur is a shy creature that emerges from its tree hole like clockwork every night at 6.30. It is one of Madagascar's nocturnal lemurs, and it is not alone. This one is undoubtedly the strangest of all. It is known as the Ai Ai. The low light camera reveals its peculiar habits. It has evolved an extraordinary feature an extremely thin skeletal finger. As it taps the tree, its acute hearing picks up the echo that indicates if there is a grub inside. When it finds one, it gnaws a hole with its rodent-like teeth. Then it can use its bizarre finger to winkle the grub out. Because of its weird appearance, some local tribes believe the Ai Ai is evil and have hunted it to near extinction. And Karana is one of its last haunts. The Ai Ai is known to be nocturnal, but crowned lemurs were previously thought to be active only by day. Now the low light camera reveals the truth. The crowns are light sleepers that alternate between rest and activity through the early hours. This is probably to guard against their main predator, the foos, which hunts mostly at night. They may also choose to be active at night to avoid dehydration during the severe heat of the day. It doesn't rain often in Ankarana, and for most of the year the only damp places are the caves. Water takes years to percolate through the massif, but as it does so, it transforms the rock. When the rains finally come, they pour through its leaky roof. Lemurs might not like the rain, but their lives depend on it. As do those of Ankarana's crocodiles. But this year, the rains only last a couple of weeks. Just enough to bring a splash of colour to the landscape. Fresh flowers are a welcome change for the lemurs, because their petals are easy to digest and the pollen is full of protein. Lemurs wean their babies after the rains because there is more food in the trees. This comes as a shock to the queen's son. Like all big babies, he's extremely reluctant to let go. The little female was weaned a few weeks earlier and is already one step ahead on the road to independence. Learning from her elders, she's asserting dominance over her male cousin even now. At this age, there are lots of things to distract the youngsters from the harsh realities of life, such as a pair of courting chameleons.
Like everything they do, chameleons take courtship one slow step at a time. They signal to each other with displays of colour. The male's red eye is a sign of his amorous intentions. While cautious foreplay may win the female over, it can make things awkward with inquisitive lemurs around. The lemurs simply can't contain their fascination. But too many noisy onlookers at such a sensitive moment can turn a chameleon off. Now his eye is no longer flushed with passion, but black with anger. <laughs> The light rains have dampened the forests and filter through to the rivers. Downstream, three months after they were laid, the crocodile eggs are starting to call. Temperature controls the sex of baby crocodiles. Because it has been a hot year, the eggs in the nest have been warmer than usual, and so most of the hatchlings are males. Their calls are heard from a distance by their mother, who has been guarding her nest all this time. She is able to maneuver her huge prehistoric body delicately. Her jaws may be able to tear large mammals to shreds, but they can also be very sensitive. They have pressure detectors that prevent them from crushing the babies. One at a time, she releases the hatchlings into sheltered nursery pools. They will be safe here for the next few weeks because she will be there to guard them. But after so little rain, the pools will soon evaporate. As the hot weather continues, all but the deepest rivers will dry out and the young crocodiles will be forced to search for another home. The elements have carved faces into the rocks of Ankarana that look down on the sunken forest below. The rains were short-lived this year, and the trees haven't produced much fruit. The queen of the crowned lemur troop has discovered a fruiting tamarind tree. Tamarind fruits have a lemon flavor pulp and are one of their favorites. But the pods aren't ripe yet. Leaves are a poor substitute because they contain toxins that are poisonous to the lemurs unless they drink regularly to flush them out. The only water left in the canopy is in the tree holes and the females pull rank. The oldest are first in line. 
Their daughters come next. The males will have to wait. And the youngest is the very last in the queue. As Ankarana dries out, the water shortage affects everything that lives here. With the rivers shrinking downstream, the young crocodiles are already on the move, looking for permanent pools where they can feed and keep cool. Though crocodiles can survive temperatures up to 45 degrees centigrade, like all cold-blooded reptiles, they can easily overheat if they don't have the means to cool their bodies. The adults, like the juveniles, must retreat upstream to stay with the water. This is a dangerous time for the people that live along the rivers, and for the crocodiles, as they are forced closer together. Crocodiles are thought to kill as many as 100 people every year in Madagascar. And it is this that has led to their persecution. Olivier wants to find out if there are fatalities here too. Could you ask her if there are any crocodiles on the river here? The women say they do see crocodiles in the river and that a villager was killed a few years ago. But more recently, the crocodiles have been taking their cattle. In Madagascar, wealth isn't calculated by how much money a family has, but by how many cattle they own. Domesticated zebu are prized possessions, and they are easy meat for crocodiles. If it was anywhere else in Madagascar, these crocodiles would already be dead, and they're living dangerously, even here. Olivier sets out to meet the one man here granted permission from the tribal king to hunt problem crocodiles. We have heard that it's probably the only uh, hunter of the area. Uh, if it's the case, he will be the one knowing where uh, a dangerous animal might be his daughter says he has recently killed a crocodile. A large skin like this one sells for as little as five pounds, but for a villager, this represents two months' wages. Her father's position makes him a wealthy and respected member of the community. There are many places in the Ankarana where there are crocodiles. At night, we can catch them by canoe. We carry an iron spear and stab them. That's for the big ones. For the small ones, we use a forked stick and pin them down behind their neck. Abdullah says he can kill up to eight crocodiles in one night. He will take any animal he can find on the river, big or small, because he doesn't believe they are sacred. But there are places where he wouldn't harm crocodiles. We know there is forest over there where it is taboo to kill crocodiles. We don't go there. We only go to places where crocodiles have turned to eating people. Like the ancient walls of the Massif, the traditions of the people have eroded over time.
but crocodiles can still find sanctuary when they retreat upstream in the dry season. This yearling crocodile has been fortunate. If it hatched downstream, then it must have traveled at least five kilometers to get here, avoiding being caught or killed on the way. Crocodiles are renowned for migrating long distances in drought conditions to search for water. But just how far do the crocodiles of Ankarana go? of Ankarana to discover if they really do go into the caves, and if so, what might attract them to such a strange place. It's not one in 50. That's great. Mm. Fantastic. There That's are so tracks crazy. in the entrance big enough to belong to a three-year-old crocodile, but do its footprints continue on inside? Olivier is used to tracking crocodiles at night. But searching by torchlight in a pitch black cave in ankle deep water is enough to send a shiver down anyone's spine. This is surprising. Yeah, it's so dark in here. Yeah. I don't know, I'd be more further than we are. Especially with croc tracks visible in the mud. I don't believe it. Look at that. Huh. This is amazing because they're always really tiny. The footprints here are even bigger than the ones outside. This one belongs to a large adult. And its skin impression is here too. This evidence is a revelation. Look there, there's an eye there. Yes. Yeah, okay, we'll get him off me. You see it? This is Olivier's first glimpse of the world's only known cave-dwelling crocodiles. But why would an animal that likes to bask in the sun come to a dark place like this? One reason may be temperature. It's warmer than expected here, 25 degrees centigrade, not too hot like outside, but warm enough for a crocodile to be active and even hunt. But what is there to eat? What we found out in the caves, you know, for the feeding of the crocodile was fantastic. There's plenty of food for small crocodile, and there's a high concentration of small fish. One species must have been isolated in these dark waters for a long time, because it has become totally blind. There are other cave-adapted creatures here too, like these shrimps. For the juvenile crocodiles, this cave makes an ideal nursery with perfect temperatures and plenty to eat. Even adult crocodiles might snack on cave fish, but they can fast for many months and probably wait until they can ambush something bigger. What fascinates Olivier most is that crocodiles normally depend on their eyesight to navigate, and it's a mystery how they find their way in these dark caverns. Like other creatures that live in this strange sanctuary, they seem to have evolved unique behavior. Life may be pleasant inside the caves, but it's increasingly uncomfortable in the forests. 
With little to eat high in the canopy, the lemurs are forced to the ground to scavenge for anything they can find. Lemurs aren't strict vegetarians, and a forest crab might be edible. But its shell is armor-plated for good reason. Lemurs have sharp enough teeth to pierce the shell of a giant pill bug. Their inquisitive nature means that they will try almost anything. The food is in short supply, and they're not the only ones after it. The ground floor is home to the lemur's greediest neighbors, the ring-tailed mongooses. The lemurs know how to frighten off the mongooses, but it's a different story when it comes to the unfamiliar. This three-meter-long boa is Madagascar's largest snake. Mongooses can bite off the head of a smaller snake and are bold enough to test the reactions of the giant boa. But they are wise not to risk a showdown with an animal that could crush and swallow them whole. With food in only a few small areas, the forest is getting crowded. The Queen's territory is being invaded by the troop next door. This time of year, weak groups are often evicted from their homes. With strength in numbers, the Queen's troop hold their ground. The community is fighting over food, and there's no water either. It is now that the wisdom of the one-eyed Queen is vital to the troop. She must lead them to a place they rarely venture. They are apprehensive about going near the cave mouths, let alone into the bowels of the earth. But they have no choice. It is the only place with any water left. Some of the family lag behind. But the Queen's eldest daughter goes first. She may inherit leadership of the troop and must learn where to guide the others and where not to. There is no shortage of water, but drinking here is dangerous.
crocodiles will attack lemurs when they venture into the caves. It's anyone's guess if they ever actually make a kill. But an old or injured lemur couldn't manage such a quick escape. Nothing is known about how often the lemurs drink in the darkness, but they have evidently been doing it for a long time. Lemur bones have been found here, and some belong to species extinct for hundreds of years. These caves echo with the spirits of the living and the dead, both animal and human. And the people of Ankarana, like the lemurs and crocodiles, have also used the caves as a place of last resort. Around 200 years ago, they were attacked by a neighboring tribe and took refuge in these caves. As they walk through the caves today, they, like the animals, are retracing the footsteps of their ancestors. It's perhaps unsurprising then that the local people revere the two animal species that have long shared their attachment to the sanctuary of Ankarana and its underground labyrinth. 